give God some praise in this place? Come on, San Bernardino. I need to hear you shout until it shakes in this place tonight. Do me a favor, just put your neighbor on notice because some of y'all may be sitting next to somebody. Uh, they may have come today to play church. But I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I didn't come to play. I came to get a breakthrough. And now if, if you don't want a lot of noise, you might want to switch sections because I intend to shout until something changes in this place. If I'm talking to you, go ahead and let your neighbor know what the next few moments is going to look like. And let them know I'm not leaving here tonight until I get what I came for. What a privilege it is to be here. Um, this place doesn't even look the same from the last time I came. I mean, I was thinking about what I was going to say about your pastor. Pastor Marco, if I could just uh, sum him up in one word. I, I was going to use crazy, but that's not politically correct. This man is fearless. This man is flat out fearless. He is the devil's worst nightmare. Now that's, that's what you do know. But I'm old enough to know that the only reason he's that fearless is because this woman he got praying beside and behind him you can't be that kind of crazy with that, without that kind of anointing. Would you praise God for Pastor Lisa? God bless you. Thank you so much. When I come into a church and I see one daughter with the grandson who's got the best hair in the whole church, by the way. This guy here, he's the most adorable thing. And you got a daughter on the stage. See, men, we're, we're busy working. That, that's the work of a woman. When, when you see all of that stuff going on while he's preaching and slaying devils and knocking on 5,000 doors with 6,000 flyers and 1,200 showing up at prayer meeting, there's a woman in the house. And so I praise God for your glory and for your anointing and for your presence in this place. I, um, I'm getting married in May. And uh, it's about time. I'm, you know... I was, I was sharing with somebody the other day, uh, what's the difference between marriage for men and women? Very simple. When women get married, it's the beginning. We got to get a new house. Where are we going to live? We, we got we to gotta get a new dress, and all of your stuff goes in the garbage, and we're going to use mine. And, but for men, when men, when we get ready to get married, it's the end. Like, I done tried everything I can do, so, you know, it's the end. <laughs> So I'm excited that the end of a season has come and the beginning of another one is here. I'm always encouraged when I come here. This place is amazing. This place is amazing. Give yourselves a hand. Are you ready for the word? Go to the Gospel of John. Chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm going to read verse 1 and a few of the following. Um, this word tonight is for anybody who has ever done anything to embarrass yourself. And I'm not talking about the people who came here today to pretend like you've always been where you are. I'm talking about people who realize that if it were not for the grace of God, on their life, that none of what you're enjoying today would be possible. 
Um, the couple that was on the screen, the, the insurance people, are they here today? Because I promise you, I was driving in town. Didn't I see a billboard that had that lady's face on it talking about insurance? And I looked at that, and, and, and I passed by it, and I thought, what, what an amazing testimony. I really, because normally you see something like that. It's a male-dominated industry. When I saw the lady, <clears throat> it was amazing. We said something in the car, and to get here and to find out that she's a part of that church, this church. Um, I don't know her, but I bet you a million dollars that her and her husband are not supposed to be where they are. I bet you. I, I, I can look at him and tell he didn't beat at least three people up <laughs> in the last decade. Easy. <laughs> Easy. But they are a reflection of the grace of God. So if you want to go from where you are now to where you know God wants you to be and you don't know how you're going to get there, this word is for you. The Bible says in verse 1, Jesus went up to the mountain of olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him. And this is talking about Jesus. And he sat down and he began to teach the people. And I'm paraphrasing. And watch what happens when he starts to teach them. The religious people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they tried to distract him. So they brought a woman and tried to embarrass her in front of Jesus. And said, Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commands us to stone a woman who does this. Now you can already tell they, they not telling the truth because if the law said that you should stone the woman, what about the man? Because she wasn't there by herself. So you can already see this story ain't gonna go right. So when they started, continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, this is verse 7, and I'll be done reading, he or she that is without sin, let him or her cast the first stone. Let me summarize it in the end. So Jesus looks at the woman, and, and as they begin to drop their rocks and walk away, Jesus says, if you have not sinned, you can stay. But if you've ever made a mistake, you got to go. And then Jesus looks up and said to the woman, how many accusers do you have left? She looked around. She says, I have none. Which means that everybody who was accusing her was just as guilty as she was. This is what I want to talk to you about tonight. If you've ever done anything that you think counts you out of the blessing of God. And if you think you've ever done anything that disqualifies you for the grace that God is getting ready to put on your life, I have come to tell you that the enemy has lied to you. And I'm only giving this message a topic so you can remember it. I want to talk about tonight from embarrassment to empowerment. From embarrassment to empowerment. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If you are an avid reader, I love, I love to read. I love to read. Not because it isn't boring, because sometimes it is. But one thing I've learned is that if you don't read anything, you will never have anything new to say. Reading gives you a perspective that is not originally yours. And if you're ever going to be effective in the world and in life, you need a perspective that you didn't come into the world with. You need a perspective that your parents didn't give you. You, you even need a perspective that you didn't learn in church. 
that I do know I saw the sign outside. That is if you're going to reach the world. I read a story some time ago, uh, and the main character of the story was a woman named Hester Prynne. Hester Prynne was a woman who had a relationship with a man who was not her husband. And as a result of that relationship, she conceived a child. And you'll know this story once I tell you what happens next. What they did is they put a scarlet letter on her chest, a red letter A on her chest, which was a way of telling everybody in the town that this woman was an adulteress. So everywhere she went, she was bound by her failure, by other failures. <laughs> you see, because what I've recognized, and it is so prevalent in the world today, and everybody is so judgmental. Oh, everybody's got something to say about everybody's business, about every circumstance. This is what I have. I've got a message for all of the nosy people watching online and in the house. All of our business ain't none of yours. <laughs> but see, judgment, Pastor Marco, is a process used by the enemy to keep us bound and tied to our trauma. See, what's wrong with most Christians is not that we're not spiritual, is that we don't have an alternative other than singing and shouting to deal with our trauma. And let me tell you, there are some things going on in your life praise and worship won't cure. Sometimes you've got you've to pray you got to fast, and oh, by the way, you may need to go find a therapist. Because what I've learned about people is that we will get practitioners for every part of our body. If we break our arm, we'll go to the doctor. If we have a heart attack, we'll go to the cardiologist. But we leave our brains up to ourselves. We leave the most important thing that we have at our disposal in the hands of an unprofessional called self. And we perpetuate the cycle of judgment over and over and over again. By the way, the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. Which means it is impossible for you to judge somebody without being judged. In other words, you are protected from judgment until you become judgmental. Then you forfeit the protection of being judged. Which is why when the disciple says, to Jesus, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. He said, okay, let's do it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What is on earth as it is in it? Give us this day our daily bread. But it gets to one point when he says, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Because why? Because I cannot be forgiven of my sin without also forgiving you for sinning against so in order to be released, I have to release you. You'd be surprised how many people in this room and watching online are bound, not because they're not strong, but because they're judgmental. I want to free you from being judgmental today. It doesn't matter what you did or what they did. It doesn't matter where you came from or where you're going. The Bible says this, and it says it very clearly. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God can use anybody to do anything at any time he chooses. The church would be much stronger if we would not put scarlet letters on people who did not start out in the church like us. If the church is ever going to be strong, we need people who used to be prostitutes. If the church is ever going to be strong, 
We need ex-drug dealers. If the church is ever going to be strong, we need felons on the deacon board. Why? So that we can build a church that speaks to people who come from all walks of life. The reason why the world doesn't want to come to the church is because everybody in the church pretends like they didn't come from the world. But let me tell you something in here. You are sitting next to somebody who used to do something that they are not proud of, but I came to shout in this place today that we're all going from embarrassment to empowerment. So this message in the time I have left is essential because if we do not pay attention to history, what does the old Spanish philosopher say? Then it will repeat itself. And if we don't confront the issue, it will repeat itself. If you don't believe me, I told you about Hester Prynne, but John chapter 8 was the historical reference for what happened with the woman with the scarlet letter because this story is also about a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And the judgmental system found her and said, come on, let me take you to this altar, stand you up here so that everybody can look at you and see what you have done. How many of y'all know people like that? They always shouldn't be doing that and you shouldn't be doing that and the Bible says oh this is gonna help somebody because I'm oh I, I hope I hope what I'm getting ready to say to you today frees and delivers you the Bible says that they were at the Feast of Tabernacles and and it had just passed well the Feast of Tabernacles is a celebration that the Jews would have every year celebrating God's deliverance from them when they were in the wilderness for 40 years so every year they would come and they would celebrate that God had brought them out. And Jesus, being a Jew, was supposed to be at the Feast of Tabernacles. But the Bible says that when they were at the feast, everybody looked around and noticed that Jesus was not there. Jesus, the good Jew, the Messiah, was not at the feast where all of the other Jews were. You know where he was? He was on the corner having street ministry. Bible says that he was in the temple teaching other people. He skipped the religious meeting to go knock on doors. He, he skipped the, the church conference and the denomination meeting to go out and help the people. And God gave me a hint to going from embarrassment to empowerment. He says, when I'm taking you from embarrassment to empowerment, you do not have to always show up where you expect it. Oh, you better hear what I'm telling you. Because when God puts a new anointing on your life, there are going to be some places they expect you to be because you are Christian and because you are a preacher or because you are a worship leader or because you're in the church. God says in this next season, I'm shaking it up. Everybody's not going to get saved at the altar. Somebody's going to get saved at the club. Everybody's not going to get saved at the revival. Somebody's going to get saved in the trap house. I wish I had somebody that understands that the glory of God still works in the dope house. And God says there is going to come a season well, the Christian is going to have to go somewhere else other than the church. Jesus said, y'all can have that. I'm going over here where I'm appreciated. How many of y'all have ever been around people that act like they didn't want you to be around? Look, looking like they just tolerate you. You know, they, it's like when Pastor Marco or Pastor Lisa will say, look at your neighbor and tell them God's going to work it out. Have you ever turned to your neighbor and they didn't say nothing to you? You look at them they just... I don't talk to my neighbor. Don't talk to me. You ever have one of those? There is coming a season in your life where you're going to have to be okay with not going where you're expected. And people are not going to appreciate you the way you want to be appreciated. But here is something I want you to put in your spirit. The next time somebody doesn't appreciate who you are and what you do, I want you to look at them and tell them, before you change, tell them this. If you don't appreciate my presence, the next thing you're going to do is experience my absence. When the pastor was up here talking about 
Speaking in your heavenly language, I started to think that in the church there are all kinds of gifts. There's the gift of giving, and there's the gift of speaking in tongues, and there's the gift of love, and there's all these other gifts. But can I tell you there's another gift you need? It's called the gift of goodbye. And you need to get the wrong people out of your life, and you need to help them go. I need you to identify five people that are not good for your life and instead of waiting on them to leave you call them and tell them you've been dismissed I'm going to another level and I don't have time to deal with people who are not going where I'm going some of y'all gonna need to open up your cell phone and when you get home you're gonna have to text them and say you know what pastor told me to tell you you're dismissed and they're gonna say from what i ain't got time to explain if you were with me at church you would have understood what i am every time i invite you to church you don't come but every time you invite me to the club i go with you i'm dismissing you you don't have to always show up where you're expected. You got a different level of anointing on you and your gift will be activated when you get in the right environment. One of the clues that you're around the wrong people is they don't recognize who you are. You don't have to explain yourself to people who have been assigned to you. Pastor Marco doesn't have to walk in the room and say, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, I love God. He doesn't have to explain that. Why? Because all of the people in the room are attached and associated with that gift. So he is what he is without an explanation. And every time you have to explain yourself over and over and over and over to the people you are around, you don't have a circle, you have a noose. And it is choking the life out of your gift. You better get your power back. And you better stop begging people to love you. And you better stop begging people to like you. And you better start recognizing that you were created by God and you were wonderfully made in Christ Jesus. And if they don't like you the way you are, then it is their problem. I am about to give you a prophetic word and you better hear me. You better stop watering yourself down because people cannot hand you, handle you at 100 proof. If they cannot handle you at your full potency, you better stop watering down your gift. Stop acting low and stop acting weak and stop weeping and wailing and lift up your hands, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong in Somebody say, I'm not showing up. Say it again, I'm not showing up. If they don't appreciate me, I'm not coming. Here's the problem, most of you don't have an attendance policy for your life. You don't have an attendance policy for your life. You don't have parameters of where you won't go, where you won't stay. Every argument you're invited to, you show up to. Every time depression says come, you come. Every time rejection says come here, you come. Every time insecurity says come, you come. Anytime suicidal thought says I want to borrow you, you come. You have to have an attendance policy for your life and you have to learn to tell life's troubles, I am not available today. I'm not available to argue today. I got to read. I'm not available to argue today. I got somewhere I have to be. It's called destiny. I'm not available to be insecure today. I'm going to be what God called me to be. I am not available to contemplate suicide today. The Bible says I shall live and not die. You have to have an attendance policy for your life. Decide where you're going to. That woman, that woman, that God. He had an attendance policy. You want me over here, but I'm useful over there. And I'm going where I'm useful and not where I'm used. I'm going where I'm useful and not where I'm used. I've learned in my life, most people don't really like you. They just borrow your influence to get other people to like them. See, because the glory is on your life. 
So they get around you so that the people who are in your life will see the glory on your life, actually on them, borrowing your influence. Attendance policy. I'm here today. I have to, listen, I'm, I have to be in Houston, Texas tomorrow. This is how dedicated I am. I still got to pick my daughter up from school tomorrow. <laughs> so I got to get out of here in the morning to land in Houston, to drive an hour from the airport, to be there with my baby sitting on the concrete, waiting on my car to get up to lane number four, because I'm going where I'm useful. I'm going where I'm useful. Yeah, yeah, I could stay in L.A. and, and go downtown and, and, and see the time. But, but what good would that do for my, my destiny is at school waiting on me? Because you have to have an attendance policy for your life. You need to be in the right place at the right time doing the thing that will connect you to your destiny. After you get an attendance policy for your life, the second thing you need to sign up for, and, and Alexander can tell you, she's got all of these policies. I think that's the lady's name. What's her name? The, the attendance, the uh, insurance lady? Elizabeth. Elizabeth will sell all this to you. The next policy she wants to sell you is you got to have an anger policy. What makes you angry? How easy is it to make you pop off? Oh, I see you here. Oh, I know you saved. I see you. <laughs> I see you. Open the grave. I'm coming out. But if somebody was stepped on your shoe, you'd be like, come on outside, dog. Because church people will, have you ever seen a church? Per, we can flip like, we can be praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody bump you. What? what, what? Jesus. We Jesus. You gotta have an anger policy. They brought that woman up there, and, and can you see her body language? They're dragging it. Come on! Oh, you shouldn't have been doing it. Now we're about to take you in front of everybody. We're gonna, we gonna deal with this today. Get in here. Can you see the woman? How would you have acted if somebody grabs you by the arm to drag you in front of the church to embarrass you? I know you got a Bible in your phone. But how many of y'all, it would have went a little different that day? She's shaking her head like, yep, Reverend, it was just, just a little bit different that day had it been you. But this woman, she let them drag her in front of the room. Here's Jesus, this woman right here was caught in the very act of adultery. You'll always know how anointed you are when they leave the other person who was at fault with you out. Dogs don't bark at parked cars. So the reason why your name was called is because you were the anointed one in the story. And you're always upset about why somebody always messing with me and why they always calling out my name. Because you are the chosen one. If you didn't have any glory, if you didn't have any anointing, if you didn't have any destiny, the enemy would not be barking at you. But the reason why he is accusing you is because there's a glory on your life. <laughs> Brought this woman up there to embarrass her. What I love about her, Pastor Lisa, is she never once, not once, do we find anywhere in the scripture did she defend herself? I wish I could come down there. I Listen to me. You have to resist the urge to always defend yourself. I'm coming down. Every time you defend yourself, you have given control of you to the accuser. 
Every time you get online and clap back. Every time you spend your time arguing with an account that has two followers. Have you? I've seen people write entire paragraphs. You don't know what you're talking about. Doing all of that. Shut up! You're wasting your time. The Bible says that he's an accuser of the brethren. If you're going to be used and empowered, the prerequisite is you must be accused first. First comes accusation, second comes authority. And if you never go through the accusation, you never get the authority. She was caught in the act of adultery. They drag her up there, right in front of everybody, just like this. She's tired. She's exhausted. She's frustrated. And she's embarrassed. But she never, ever defends herself. And every time you defend yourself, you've given control over to the person who accused you. I got to tell my side of the story. Why are you telling your side of the story to somebody who's already committed to not believing you? They're already committed to believing what they want to believe, and it doesn't matter what you say, it will not change the matter because first comes the accusation, then comes the authority. And you cannot skip any step in the process. You got to go through this in order to get to that. And if you want that, then you got to handle this. If you don't want to be fired, don't ask God for the company. Because in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to be fired. If you don't want the mansion, don't cry about the house. Why? Because sometimes you have to lose a thing in order to get a thing. And I want to tell somebody something in here today. You don't have time to cry about what you lost because you're going to need to smile about what God's about to give you. Do me a favor. Fist bump your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you don't have time to lose your mind over something you lost. You're going to need your mind for what God's about to give you. You can't lose your mind over the man you lost. You're going to need your mind for the man God's about to send. You can't lose your mind over the car they repossess. You're going to need your mind for the guard God's about to send. You can't lose your mind over an apartment. You got a mansion with your name on it. You can't lose your mind over what you lost. You're going to need it for what God's about to send. And I don't know why God just put this in my spirit, but there is there are three women in this room today. You have had a miscarriage in the last six months, and you were about to give up. God told me to tell you you cannot lose your mind over the child you lost because you're going to get pregnant by the 3rd of April. I don't know where it came from. By the 3rd of April, God's going to put another seed in your... Oh, God, help me in this. But in order to do that... You have to learn to manage your anger when you're being accused. You have to make your anger so expensive that nobody can afford it. And you have to make your happiness so cheap anybody can get it. You have to make your anger so expensive that nobody can afford it. And your happiness so cheap that anybody can get it. Stop letting everything and everybody upset you. Never let anybody you don't respect upset you. You've got too much to do to be worried about the opinion of somebody who doesn't know me. You don't know where I come from. I, I remember one time, Pastor Marco, and I'll say this publicly, I, I drove, I, I bought a car. I, you know, I've been doing business my whole life. One day I wanted a toy, I bought a Porsche, so what? Leave me alone, shut up. <laughs> I bought it. I mean, anybody who's sold as many books as me and built as many houses as I have and, and has done as many things as I have, you ought to be able to afford something like that. I remember I bought it, somebody said something to me about it, and, 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 but they done had three cars since they complained about that, but that's a whole nother story. Uh, 
but, but they said something to me about it, and, and I remember being heartbroken about it, and I remember being upset about it. Then I had to realize, I had to realize something, that because of the position that I had, it brought scrutiny to the decision. It brought, it brought scrutiny to the decision. And, and, and so what I realized is, is that it wasn't, and, and this is, it was my fault, it wasn't what I had, it was the timing. Hmm. It, it, was, it was the timing. It was the timing. Because whenever God puts you out front, sometimes you have to live like you're in the back. It's, it's, it's timing. It's timing. At the time, we were doing things like building churches. At the time, we were, we were asking people to give so that we could so that we could build and so it was the timing and and so I never will forget how I knew it was the wrong idea Bishop Jakes came to Houston I drove to the hotel and picked him up in that car and he got in the car and slammed the door now, I know he the bishop but I was like Slams the door. Boom! Okay. Maybe he's heavy-handed. So, so we go to the mall, get some stuff, take him back to the hotel. He gets out of the car. Boom! Say it. First time is a mistake. Second time is a decision. So I roll the window down. And I said, Bishop! He said, yeah. I said, is, is something wrong? And he just let me have it. He said, you're asking people to sacrifice. It don't look like you sacrificing. <laughs> Never confuse correction with judgment. <laughs> they feel similar, Armando. They, they feel similar, Pastor, but, but they are not the same thing. Judgment comes from the enemy. Correction comes from the Father. And that was the difference between Jesus and them. He came to correct the situation. They came to judge the situation. She had her anger intact. After she goes from the anger policy... Jesus shows us the last thing that we need to have when we go from embarrassed to empowerment. You need to have an acknowledgement policy for your life. Everything that happens to you doesn't need to be acknowledged. They come to Jesus and say, well, teach. Since you're teaching, um, what you going to say about this situation? You out here, you know, quoting all these scriptures, talking about you the Messiah, talking about you God's son. What you going to say about one of these laws that this lady broke? They were setting him up so that he would say something to indict himself. But Jesus has an acknowledgement policy. He doesn't respond to the accusation. The Bible says, he says, bent down and started to write in the dirt. Donald Parson out of Chicago, Illinois says, we don't know what he wrote, but here's my supposition. The men were getting ready to stone the woman for adultery. He started to write their sins in the dirt. Robert was at the crack house <laughs> when he told his wife he was at the church house. <laughs> Susan hasn't paid her taxes in three years. And they looked and saw their sin in the dirt and dropped their rock. 
That's why you don't have to get even with your enemies. God will write their sins in the dirt. Judge not lest ye be judged. Tell your neighbor, I'm not perfect, but you better leave me alone because I'm a king's kid. And anybody who messes with me, messes with my daddy. cannot hear you. I said shout. Shout. Somebody shout I'm not perfect but I'm a king's kid. I make mistakes but I'm a king's kid. I don't always get it right but I'm a king's kid. He who is without sin let them Just look at your name and say, you ain't no better than me. Nope. Nope, the Bible says we're all dirt created from the dust of the earth. That means that if you drive a Bentley and I catch a bus, that just means you are dirt that rides better than me. I improve. Yeah, how, how many of y'all have ever taken a bath, uh, and you got to take a good bath to do this, but ever take a bath in the tub and it leave that ring around there? And you be like, I don't know where they came from. You, you don't. Or are you wear a white shirt and, 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 and it's got dirt on the collar? You're like, ooh, where did that come from? You. You got a mansion, you just dirt living good. If you got money in the bank, you're rich dirt. <laughs> We're all dirt. Born into sin, shaping in iniquity. There is enough to be embarrassed about, but there is so much more to be empowered about. <laughs> Jesus said, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. I know why the Lord gave me this message. Is it all right, Pastor, if I do this? I know the Lord gave me this message because something strikes me about this church. You guys don't go after the typical Christian. You, I, I get the feeling that y'all just go after anybody. No. I'm looking around this church, and it's eclectic. This, this, this is not normal. And, and I'm not being judgmental. I'm not being funny. I, I'm looking at people I know been in jail before. <laughs> Sitting next to people who are lawyers. Sitting next to people who are in college. Sitting next to people who are rich, sitting next to people who, who, who got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So it lets me know that there are a lot of people in here that the devil tried to shame you. But no weapon formed against you was able to prosper. I need every survivor in this room to stand up on your feet and let the devil know you should have killed me when you had the chance. But now I've got power. Somebody shout, I got power. Somebody shout, I got power. Somebody shout, I got power. Give your neighbor a high five. Shout, neighbor, you're looking at somebody who the devil tried to kill. But I am a survivor. When I saw the red letter, they should have, they could have picked any other color. It should have been a blue letter. That would have been better. Could have been a white letter. They could have embroidered it with white. They picked the wrong color. Pick 
picked the wrong color. Because red just so happens to be the same color as what came out of Jesus on Calvary. Tell your neighbor, shall neighbor, the devil should have left me alone. But this is the year of my destiny. This is the year of my breakthrough. Shout it, yeah. Shout it, yeah. Hallelujah. This is why there was something in the tabernacle called the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was something called the mercy seat. And what they will sprinkle on the mercy seat is the blood of the Lamb. But the reason why Jesus Christ came, young lady, is he says you no longer need a lamb for the sins of the world. I am the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And you don't have to get blood from me every year. One and done. So the Bible says a group of men steal the Ark of the Covenant from Israel. They put it in their camp. All kinds of bad things start to happen to them. They put the Ark of the Covenant out front, and they say for all of the people to see it because it represents the presence of God. And so people came, but they knew not to touch it. So they stayed back and looked at the Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Covenant from a distance. But the Bible says that a few crazy people came and tried to touch it. And the Bible says they fell and died. And the Lord showed me a revelation. The reason why they died is not because they touched it, but because the blood was on it. And they tried to lift the lid and look at what was under the blood. And God was sending a signal. Don't you ever touch anything that's been covered by the blood. If you've ever accepted Jesus Christ in this place, I came to announce you're off limits. The devil is defeated. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. If you believe it, give God some praise. Somebody shout a yeah. Shout a yeah. Shout a yeah. Have you ever been mistreated? Have you ever been abused? Sir, let me tell you something. You're going to be blessed. And you want me to tell you why? Because God is always watching how people treat the wounded. I don't know you. But there's an anointing on your life. I speak double portion over your life. Your sins have been forgiven. Go and sin no more. Don't worry about what they got to say about you. Listen. The amount of jealousy that this city is about to have over this church in the next five years. I say this under the authority of the Holy Ghost. This church is about to explode so bad other churches are going to have to close down. There's going to be a drawing. This church is going to empty churches. And there is nothing wrong with that. Because businesses merge all the time. This sanctuary, the walls are going to have to be blown out. The sanctuary size is going to have to be increased. Other areas of the church are going to have to shrink because there are going to be more and more people who are going to sit in this place and want to hear 
what the Spirit has to say. You may have to give up the cafe to get more sanctuary space. You may have to give up other spaces just to get it done. The parking lot across the street is yours. The parking lot to the right is yours. The parking lot to the left is yours. The parking lot over that fence is yours. You're going to be parking all around this place. And it's going to be a church full of people with scarlet letters. <laughs> a whole bunch of people that the devil thought that he had canceled you out. And God is going to use you, the one nobody thought could be used, to change this city around. And some of y'all are going to have to be wealthy. Some of you are going to have to be wealthy because what God is getting ready to do is going to take money to do it. And some of y'all are going to have to do away with this cloud of being, of this being one of the most poverty-stricken areas. God's going to raise the median income because of what he's getting ready to do in the lives of people right in this ministry. If you believe it, give him some glory. No. because of what you did God couldn't use you and if you looked at perhaps all of these counselors and ministers and you thought I don't measure up to that I'm just me what if I told you God has never called a qualified person in the history of the world but God has qualified everybody he's called and if you want to move from embarrassed to empowered I need you to flood this altar right now I want to pray for you if you want me to pray for you I don't care where you are from the back from the side just come to this altar right now come to this altar come to this altar dead bones are about to live again Hopes and dreams are about to come alive. He's about to give you vision in the middle of the night. God's gonna use you to take this church to the next level. I don't care who you are, where you came from. He can use you just like you are.
so you believe in the power of God. Please look at me. I've got a little story to tell you. I pulled my first gun on somebody when I was in the sixth grade. I was born in Gary, Indiana. My father was the pastor of the church that I went to, but I didn't know he was my father. But he knew I was his son. So I went to church every week looking at the preacher saying, I wish he was my dad. Only to find out at the age of 12 that he was my father the whole time. I went my whole life with no father. Oh, but I lived five blocks from him. We lived on the same street. I remember going to him one day and said, my mom told me you're my father. Are you my father? He said, yes. I said, when were you going to tell me? He said, eventually. So I grew up with all this pent up anger and rage inside of me. Because let me tell you something. The first person to let a man know who he is is not his mama, it's his daddy. And that's why there's so many lost men in the world. Is because the only thing, and I say this with all due respect, the only thing a woman can teach a man is how to be the man she wants all men to be. And that's not a bad thing. But there are some experiences that men have that cannot come from a female perspective. So what happens, listen to me women, when women raise men, you typically raise a man who has rage because you give him his emotions, but men were not created to have emotions, so it becomes rage. So that's why when young men get upset, they do stuff like this. It's because I've got mama's outlet, but I've still got my equipment. See, a man is supposed to look at his son and say, son, think twice before you act once. Once you put your hands on a woman, no matter what she says. You be respectful. You say, yes, sir. No, sir. See that? Come on now. Yo, help me out. That's, that's not being sexist. That's the way God made it. Which is why it has always been the enemy's job to try to keep men out of the family. Daughters need their fathers just as much as sons do. The first person to tell a young girl she's beautiful should be her dad, not her boyfriend. So I grew up mad. And I remember I told him, I said, it hurts me to know that I'm your son. And I hear you preach on Sundays about how fathers are supposed to take care of their children and you don't take care of me, the man looked me in my face and said, if it hurts you that bad, you may need to go to another church. But I did not leave. Because the Bible says, honor your father and mother, that your days might be long. And I knew my life was on the line, even though he did not treat me the way I wanted to be treated. Judge not lest you be judged. This is how Bishop Jakes became my mentor. He looked at me and he said, you got a lot of father issues, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, uh, let me help you understand something. Pastor Marco, my father was married during the whole season of this, so he never got a divorce. So both my sister and I were illegitimate children. He told me, he said, but you haven't lived. See, my father had me when he was 42. I'm 40 now. He looked at me and he said, you don't know what it's like to be a 42-year-old man married to somebody who you may not think likes you. And at 42, somebody 28 comes along and makes you feel good about yourself. He said, wait until you're 40 until you judge. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Because, see, a lot of the things that you judge your parents about, you haven't lived long enough to experience the position they were in when they had to make the choices that hurt you. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, but 
now that I am a man, I put away childish things. And I understand now that all of that had to happen. It was a part of my destiny. It was a part of my destiny. And the only job I have now is to get on a plane tomorrow at 8 o'clock and get back to Houston, Texas and go get my baby from school because I'm breaking the curse. From him. Did you switch to me? Yep, out there live. They're looking at me right now. Yep, yep. Please, please put God to the sanctuary. Cry. Yep. Young lady, cry. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Sometimes you gotta scream. You do. You can't go around just holding it in. You're gonna, you're gonna hurt yourself. All pressure needs an outlet. This is why praise is a weapon. That we shout and we release until something happens. I decree in the name of Jesus, this church is a house of prophecy. And that God is about to shake this city starting at this address and he's about to heal you everywhere you hurt now what I want you to do don't leave this altar with the pain you brought up here cast your cares on him because he cares for you I'm going to pray for you and in 30 seconds I want you to release a praise in this place which is a signal that you're releasing all of the hurt that has held you and, and had you captive and bound. God, in the name of Jesus, release my brothers and my sisters from every walk of life, every social economic status and class. It doesn't matter if we're black, white, Latino, Asian, Native American. It doesn't matter what we are right now, God. Your blood covers us all. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if we're tall or not. It doesn't matter if we live in an apartment or a mansion. It doesn't matter. You don't care about any of that. All you care is about the heart. And so God created us a clean heart and renewing us a right spirit and put us in position to be not just enough, but to be more than enough. In Jesus' name, I come up against suicide. In Jesus' name, I come up against depression. In Jesus' name, I come up against insecurity. In Jesus' name, I come up against rejection. And who the Son has set free is free in if you believe I'll just pray for you and you believe God is about to wipe it away I want you to shout in this place and release a sound come on way up come on and release it come on I can't hear you shout release it right now release it Every head bow, every eyes closed in this place right now. If you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is your moment. This is your moment right now to release everything and surrender everything to Jesus Christ. Every head bow, every eyes closed right now. You say, I need to surrender to God right now. I want to let it go. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Jesus, come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. Today I receive freedom. Today I receive breakthrough for who the sun sets free is free indeed. Holy Spirit, fill me. Jesus, I thank you. I surrender all my cares to you. I surrender my hurt to you. I surrender my heart to you. Today I am saved. Today I am born again. Set me free, Jesus. Holy Spirit, fill me. God, I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Give the Lord a big shout of praise tonight.